Good morning. We're going to allow people to come in. We'll start in about two, two minutes. Good morning, everybody. So Ron, you said you've you've used it before, though, correct? Just on a limited basis, yeah. And um, obviously now post COVID, it seems like it's a multi multiple occurrences in any given day. Very true. Very true. Yeah. I heard Zoom was down worldwide yesterday. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. Is it probably just just because of the the utilization? Probably right. I don't know. I was um, I was tuning into a church broadcast and they were doing it on Facebook Live because they said Zoom was down. Interesting. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Candid Conversations, a white guy's perspective on advancing equity. My name is Claude Robinson, I'm Executive Vice President of External Affairs and diversity at UCAN. I'm honored to serve at UCAN. I've been there for 25 years putting in work. And um, UCAN is a 151 year old organization whose vision is that youth who have suffered trauma can become our future leaders. We invite you to visit our website, www.ucanchicago.org, and um, check us out on all social media sites. Um, I don't think we rock on too, TikTok too much, but all the other sites um, definitely we're involved in. Um, I want to set a little context for our conversation today, um, knowing that everything begins with a conversation. Our knowing who we are, um, how we fundamentally sit inside of this world, our attitudes and belief systems all have been shaped and formed by the conversations that we've had with people and also um, the relationships that we've had. So this kind of conversation is one that, that's hopeful and wants to motivate and inspire people and inspire them to get involved as allies in the fight to end injustice, inequity, and dismantle racism. <clears throat> I'd like to let the audience know that um, as the moderator today, I'm, I'm fully aware of the deep-seated um, angst, the anger, cynicism, skepticism that comes along with conversations um, about racism. And I'm hopeful that each one of you is here um, and has an open mind, willing to have a conversation in hopes that this conversation is one that's seen as a solution to the problem and not exacerbating it like so many conversations during this point in time. And with that, I want to introduce um, our esteemed panelists. Um, Ronald Kluwer is the Illinois Market President for Gorman and Company. Chris Rapasarda is the Director of Violence Intervention and Prevention Services at UCAN. Senior Pastor for St. Paul's United Church of Christ, Matt Fitzgerald. And then Mike Bertrand is the president and CEO of Lutheran Child and Family Services of Illinois. Gentlemen, welcome. Let's Thank jump right in, um, to, to the conversation, um, the questions. The first question I want to ask, and it, it's a simple one. However, um, the solution to, to ending it is not. Um, do you believe that racism exists in society today? Chris, can you start us off? Sure. Thank you, Claude, and thanks everyone for being with us. Uh, yes, I think it's the short answer. Absolutely exists today, um, here and across across this world. You just looking for a yes no, Claude? Yeah, just go yes or no with this question Got it. now, uh, Matt. Unfortunately, absolutely yes. Okay, Ryan. I'd say absolutely. Absolutely, and then Mike. Absolutely, yes. Okay, so Ron, to, fur to further that question, um, why do you believe it exists? 
I mean, it's so prevalent and um, invisible in today's society. It always has been, but it seems of late, it's, it's even much more visible. Um, through my own experiences over the last few years in engaging and in trying to advance affordable housing, you see everything from a, a fear of what you are going to bring into a, into a neighborhood. Um, and I think there are some people legitimately concerned about property values and traffic. But on the other far end of that, um, you see glaring examples of racism, including name calling, um, and you know, well beyond bias. The the you know the evidence is just there. Okay, Chris, why why do you think it exists? Well, I think it exists still today because it's uh, it's the fabric and foundation of places like the United States, right? So now we see it in our our systems and our institutions. Um, and I think it exists in the beginning because people are, are quick to, to both find commonality and difference with others. Uh, and so back, uh, way back when we didn't have an idea of race, this is a social construction, right? But, uh, but now it seems like it's the only way we can uh, view one another. Okay, Mike? Yeah, so in, in, you know, in, in, in my journey, clearly, uh, I always thought there were racists. There were people out there that were racist and um, uh, treated people of, of, of other colors uh, um, differently. Uh, what, you know, what, you know, in my own journey, racism, um, as, as I hope most on this call know or do some delving into, is, is, why, is wired throughout the fabric of our society, both in legal, legal structures uh, uh, and um, kind of culturally taught um, uh, pieces so that to, so to me i've i've come to a place of, of distinguishing between a racist and racism and racism is is uh, much deeper uh in in how we structured our, our country and our society okay thanks mike and matt well i think the other gentlemen have, have explained the, the why it exists very well i think to think about why it seems to be getting worse what is going on with white people that is causing not only sort of deeply entrenched systemic racism to continue, but also hateful whites to feel free to speak out. Um, and I think, you know, that of course comes from uh, our political rhetoric and uh, a president who uses that kind of language in those sorts of divisions, racial racist divisions to empower himself. And I think that for white men right now, um, I'm 50, so maybe my generation was right on the cusp of this or initially, but there's a fragility out there with white men because things that we might have been raised to take for granted in terms of our own identities and power being innately good are suspect. And that I think is difficult if people are honest for every white man who's reckoning with it at least, but the response from many who aren't you know, I don't know why, is, is uh, to double down and to become um, where you might have had sort of a country club racist 10, 15 years ago. You're looking at outright hate right now that is just, you know, the masks off. Um, it's a troubling time. So, yeah, er earlier this year, um, I was asked to speak to a group, um, prim primarily Caucasian group of leaders downstate Illinois. And I asked the question um, to them, how often do you speak about race or issues of racism? And it, it was like, a, it was silent in there. Um, and I was a little taken back by it. And I was like, huh, are y'all talk about it and stuff like that? And it was, it was pretty, pretty uncomfortable um, quietness. And I wanted to a ask our second question, um, Ron, you know, do you find it difficult to talk about white racism? You know, I don't find it difficult at all. And maybe that's, you know, some of the, the challenge of late um, in certain circles I'm in. I think there's those other white folks like me in a position of power. And when I bring up racism, there, there's a, you know, almost, uh, oh, here we go again, you know, look that comes across the room in some cases. But I, I think we have to continue to talk about it. I, I think if we don't, we're not going to get past it. I think there are those white folks who can admit that racism exists and that we should do our best 
um, to help advance um, equity. But at the same time, I think there's folks who feel really uncomfortable. And then I think there are folks who, you know, in a room like that, when it's called out, just want to mask their own racist tendencies. And so it, it, um, it does become difficult to talk about, but I think we absolutely have to. Okay, Chris, how about you? Do you find it difficult? Um, you know, Claude, I think sometimes a lot has to do with who's, who's in the room, right? So I think when I'm, when I'm in a space, um, I'm always a white man in that room, right? But that doesn't mean we're always gonna talk about race. Um, and I think especially when I'm in a room of mostly white people, um, race doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to come up even though it permeates everything about that space. Um, so I think it's, it's uncomfortable to talk about, um, especially for white people. I think for me, um, I'm really comfortable with the uncomfortable. Um, and so I, I look forward to those conversations. I wouldn't ever say that they're, they're easy, but they're important and I'm, I'm happy to have them. Mm -hmm. And Mike, how about you? Yeah, so building on, on what others said, um, it's, it, it, it can be difficult, which to me goes to the importance. Um, we've, we've, within my organization, um, have made, said we're going to have those conversations. We're not going to be a place that's afraid to have those. Does that mean they're happening freely? No. Um, uh, but yes, so uh, regardless of any room, both within our organization or um, social circle, uh, it's an uncomfortable conversation, which to me, uh, if, it, if it wasn't important, it, wouldn't, it would be easy. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it wasn't an issue, it would be easy. Uh, so that uncomfortableness um, goes to how important it is to, uh, to have these conversations if we're gonna try to move beyond this. Okay, great. So I want to turn to to the next. Claude, let me, hey, Claude, can I jump in just one quick thing hey, on that? Go ahead, one? Matt. Well, I think I think it is difficult for white people to talk about racism, um, and I think in my experience of of leading conversations when I'm talking to white people and and we touch on race, it the difficulty lies in in the shame that we feel, uh, and I think that that's real, and when you know, shame is a powerful and, and sometimes necessary, but, but destructive feeling. And it, you get your cortisol running, you get, you know, inflamed and defensive. And so I think that just to acknowledge the shameful dimension for white people, you know, white people who, who are sensitive to these things and want change, um, to be aware of the embarrassment's the wrong word, but the the guilt and the shame that are there. Okay, so I'm gonna stick with you real quick, Matt, because um, I, I've had conversations um, around this particular session today, and there are some people who are um, incredibly angry at white men um, for, for building this construct, but then also benefiting from it at, at the expense of others. Um, do, do you think, and I'm, Matt, do you think white men have a role in dismantling um, or eradicating racism? Absolutely. But I think that it's not, the, it's a tricky thing because the role is to be deferential and supportive and also at the same time to acknowledge our power. Uh, but what's not helpful in my experience is to suddenly come into a place of being aware, being woke all of a sudden, and then being the white hero who's gonna solve problems. Um, yeah, that's a good point, Matt. I wanna, I, I was going, if somebody, Ron, if you can pick up on that after Matt, uh, that'd be great, but. Sure. Go ahead, you were saying, Matt. Uh, oh, that's it, just, yes, I think we have a role to play, but it's a role of acknowledging our own power and then uh, being willing to, to let go of it and also to be in a, not in the driver's seat in that process. Mm -hmm. So Mike, can you go real quick um, and just follow just from a, a white male perspective, you know, what, what's your role? And, and even with the skepticism that comes with it, um, what, what's your role? Sure, uh, I, I think as, as, as Matt said, or Pastor Matt said, um, uh, to come along as ally, not to be in the power position, but what's real important is 
Um, I think a vast majority of, of white Americans would say uh, racism isn't a problem. Or yeah, there's, there's those hate groups and they have a problem, but overall uh, there's no um, racism in, 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 uh, in the United States. So I think it behooves us uh, it be, as an ally to say, to be, we'll say, well, hold on, yeah, hold on. <laughs> um, the, yes, there is. Uh, and, and if we want to move beyond that, we need to have those conversations and, and look at how, again, as an ally uh, with people of color, uh, uh, not as the white savior. Okay. So Chris, can you, can you talk a little bit about that? How, you know, you work primarily with African-American youth, children, and families, and your focus is in North Lawndale. So h how do you navigate not being, you know, considered this white savior swooping in to, to save everybody? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, I think it's a lot of certainly what Mike and, and Matt, Pastor Matt spoke to already, but um, you know, I think some of it is an awareness, right? So um, I'm, a, I'm a white man, right? And I need to, to acknowledge that, right? Not go within, um, we are all one people kind of unifying thing, which is important, but also acknowledging those differences, right? And that my lived experience being a white man growing up outside Chicago, North suburbs is really different than for somebody who's every day is, is living in, in North Lawndale and the things that they have to deal with and grapple with um, in a racist, supremacist, white supremacist society, right? So some of it is being able to talk about it, right? Um, I think there's certainly a piece of deferential, um, but there's also a piece of um, where, where I need to use my power to talk to other white people, right? Um, and that's how I show up, right? Is, is doing the work with other white people where we can actually talk about race uh, and racism uh, and privilege. Um, and so I think that's really been important for me. And you know, for me as a newer person, both to the community and, and to this organization, uh, my job is, is first and foremost to listen, right? Not to think I'm the smartest person in the room, um, but to show up and to listen, to know where I can insert myself and collaborate um, and join in um, and, and, and allowing others, others to lead, right? Because that's, that's not my role. My role is to, um, to join, absolutely. Okay. And for, for the keep the audience uh, in the chats and things like that, we are going to have a, a question and answer session. So with the chat, uh, I am looking at the questions coming in. And also, if you can put it in the Q&A, we can answer those um, soon. So Ryan, can you speak to that, the white savior? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it's a difficult thing to navigate, to be quite honest with you. I, I think just as white folks have different views of racism and the, the depth of its existence, I think there are also black and brown people who have different views of what white savior is. I've been in groups, you know, who are, you know, are saying, you know, yes, we want you to use your power to open the doors and then step aside. But then there are others who may feel like having that white power to, you know, open the door, so to speak, in itself is serving as the white savior and they want to earn that space themselves. And so it, you know, it's one of those things that I, I think, uh, you know, to, um, to earlier points about listening, um, limpus, uh, listening and then empathizing to understand. And then, you know, it, it has to become unique to each situation because it, you know, it, it could be viewed as you're trying to be the white savior. And, and that's happened in the past with situations I've been in. That was never, ever the intent to be. It's just to acknowledge that I have this power as an old white guy. And, you know, for whatever, whatever reason, beyond that power, I was given this position, um, particularly when I served as the housing authority of the CEO, or excuse me, housing authority CEO here in Rockford. I represented a very large group of African-American impoverished people, but I, I recognized that my job wasn't to be their face, but to, to really be there to help them hear it and get their stories heard. Okay, great, thanks. So Nicole, let's go to our first poll question for the audience to answer. And if you could take a look at that, how often do you talk about racism? We'd love to hear from everybody that's on the virtual call right now. We've got about a minute or so, and then we're going to jump into our next question.
oh damn, I can't vote. I was going to vote. Yes, I, I tried <laughs> to vote too. Yeah, yeah, we're out. It says right there, we cannot. <laughs> <laughs> that damn sure is going to put my vote in. All right. Yeah. <laughs> So, Nicole, how do we look? So, we still have people coming in. Um, I'm going to give it about another few seconds, guys, and then we're going to close the poll in about five seconds. <clears throat> All right. So, 32% of people say they talk about racism daily. And 51% say they talk about it weekly, um, with a low number of 16% saying that they talk about it monthly. Okay, great. Thanks for that. We have um, two other poll questions that we'll ask throughout um, today's webinar. And time is moving quick. So I want to <laughs> jump into our next question. Um, <clears throat> so my, my son is home from college. Um, he's a college athlete, basketball player and um, he's trying to stay in shape during this COVID culture. And I decided since I don't have to um, run around as much at work being sheltered at home, that I do some exercising and trying to get back in shape with him as well. And one of his goals that I've talked to him about for years was his diet, um, getting rest and water intake and things like that. And um, I'm terrible at that now. And he's actually pretty good at it. And then uh, last week, he called me on my BS. Uh, we, were, we were leaving a workout, and I was like, hey, let's go to Culver's real quick. So he was like, man, I, uh, I really don't want to do that. Uh, and then the next day, we went to McDonald's, and he was like, dad, yo, I thought, you know, we were checking out our diet, and you were trying to be healthy and stuff like that. And I appreciated it, you know, being called on my BS. Um, when I say my BS, I'm calling blind spots, okay? And all of us have blind spots. And a as white men, I wanted to ask you the question, something similar. You know, are you aware or have people called you out on your blind spots as it relates to this topic? And I'll start with uh, um, Brian and then come to Mike. Oh, absolutely. Especially back um, when I was early in my career at the Housing Authority, um, you know, getting out to the developments as the as the director and, and trying to lead my team, I felt I needed to get out and understand how our, you know, how our residents were living and who our residents were and the challenges they were facing um, and the, you know, the lack of access. And so as as I was early in doing that, um, I had a lot of folks who called BS, um, as you say, uh, Claude, to say, you know, you don't, you don't understand what it's like out here. And the more time I spent in our developments in neighborhoods that were disconnected intentionally, um, designed to be uh, disconnected from the rest of the community, I, I really began to realize what they were talking about. And the more and more I, you know, I was embedded there, the, the more evident it became. Okay. And Mike, how about you? Yeah, so um, both. Uh, I, I'm greatly appreciative to have colleagues around me uh, that call me out on a blind spot when, when we're discussing uh, perhaps a, a policy or, or a situation and they, they look at me and say, but you come from a white male perspective um, mm -hmm. and, and look at this differently. Uh, that and, and, and trying to catch my own blind spots. If I'm walking down the street, do I, walk, do I react differently um, to a, a group of 17-year-old um, African-American males than I do to a group of 17-year-old Caucasian males. Uh, and, and given, given have been all what society has, has, has ingrained regarding that. So it's also trying to catch myself uh, in my blind spots. Yeah, so Mike, as you were saying that, uh, then I wanna come to Chris real quick. <clears throat> we, we were having um, a conversation at UCAN <clears throat> about um, active shooter training. Um, and as I was sitting in the, in the discussion and they were talking about, you know, our clientele um, that we work with in North Lawndale and things like that. And then I was just like, damn, I was like, I'll go, we're worried about our uh, clients, African-American clients. 
I was like, what's the profile of um, active shooters? You know, shit, that's, that's white people, dudes coming in here are angry, like in, in Michigan, right? I'm like, Ain't that the, shouldn't we be talking about that? And things like that. So when you, when you mentioned that, I, that came to mind to me, how um, people can have blind spots based on just what, what they think we should be doing or profile on people. And there's a, a case study, a historical case study of who's been the most brutal, you know, in, in active shooting. So um, it's just something that, that came to mind. And uh, Matt, can you share from, from your perspective really quick the same, any, any blind spots? And you know, Matt, I, I consider you and uh, Pastor Otis Moss um, really great thinkers. And um, it's something that I, that I, I really uh, in, I'm endeared to. So what blind spots mm -hmm. have you been called out on or that you're aware of? Well, thanks, Claude. Um, that's, a, that's high praise to be uh, placed uh, alongside Otis. So uh, <laughs> now that you've inflated my ego, I'll, I'll tell you uh, how stupid I am. Um, I think that unavoidably, at almost any time as a white man, I'm going into a situation where um, – I'm going to try to be honest about race, acknowledging it and discussing it if it's out on the table, or just speaking from my perspective with people, uh, African American people in general, in my experience, um, more so than other races. There, I'm. You're gonna. I'm gonna put my foot in my mouth. I'm gonna say something stupid, uh, or I'm gonna just keep my mouth shut. And so. I would say, first of all, just to think, I mean, not every time I'm going to say something stupid, but occasionally, or I'll make mistakes. And Martin Luther says, essentially, we shouldn't try to live our lives walking on eggshells, afraid of committing a sin. We, we ought to, he says, sin boldly, so that grace might abound all the more boldly. So over the years, what I've tried to do is to realize going in, this isn't going to go well. It's not going to go perfectly, excuse me. It's not going to be ideal. Uh, and there will probably be instances or moments in which I feel that kind of shame I was talking about earlier or a regret that I might have said something differently, uh, not listened well enough. And to know that, be ready for it and learn from it, not to think I'm going to be perfect. And just a quick example, uh, although examples abound, but um, I did at our church couple of months ago or maybe it was longer three months now we have we're partnered with an african-american church that's in our building and uh, that's a primarily lgbtq black church lighthouse you know jamie club the pastor there and we did an evening of uh queer poetry i like poetry a lot so jamie and i selected some poems and one of the poems that i selected had some language in it not racial language but uh gendered and, and uh language about lesbian women written by a lesbian um that was offensive to some of the younger women in the group and i read it and it's and i realized as soon as i was like in the process of reading this thing i just had this oh shit feeling when i looked at some of the women's faces in the group and then i i thought well i'm gonna have to take my lumps here um and that was a mistake and instead of rushing to an apology or pretending it hadn't happened just like sit and be and that's i, I tried to do that but had i been thinking out of the gate um about who I was going to be with and what their perspectives might be. I, you know, I wish I hadn't done that. So yeah, absolutely. I, I grew up in a multiracial home and I think sometimes I can then feel that I've got some kind of unique advantage or uh, like, <laughs> you know, that I'm more, my, I mean, my uh, siblings who are uh, Asian. Uh, so it's not like I grew up in black culture, but from that I can kind of, start to think a little too highly of myself in terms of my ability to see things from other people's perspectives, but I'm stuck in mine. Right. Right. Okay. And Chris, can you, can you share um, earlier, you mentioned when you, you can't change, you know, who, who you are um, as, as a white man. And then you say that when you enter a room, that dynamic is there. What, what assumptions have people, people made about you um, because of that, what they perceive that just aren't true? 
That's a good question, Claude. Well, and there, there, there's only so many that I know, right? Because we all make uh, make judgments probably about each other too, without without vocalizing it always, right? But I think uh, one that comes to mind for me was at a an event kind of similar to this. It was a dialogue event uh, a few years ago. I was at and uh, multiracial tables, and uh, this woman of color uh, was asked what was an assumption that she might have had about white men and you know she looked at me and she had held the belief that uh all white men were pedophiles right that it was white men who abused children um now this was the first time that i had heard this um it is rare at least in my experience as a white man um that there are any uh any tropes that are put on uh, white men right that we seem to somehow be exempt from any uh classification in that way, right? Um, and it was also really, really important to hear, right? That she had had this experience or education or information that had led her to believe that um, I, as a white man, was uh, grouped with other people who had committed this crime, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's something that I, that I, I try to remember and think about, right? Um, because that's a microcosm of what so many other people have to deal with in our society on a not just day-to-day -day basis, but every moment of every day, right? It's the way people uh, look at, interact, and think about them in this white supremacist society in this country. And so, um, you know, for me, um, I know, I know I absolutely have blind spots. And I think as a white man, um, I think I and probably the other panelists on this call have as few um, I think when we err, people are less likely to confront us about it, right? right? And so it's really my job to to be reflective, to be accountable, um, and to do what I can both when I err to acknowledge it, um, but also to know that that's not somebody else's work to do, right? That's my work. Um, I need to do that. Right. And Mike, can you expound on that a little as well? You know, what assumptions that people made about you that, that just aren't true. Sure. So I, I, th I think to say that is to, to, to um, echo a little bit what Chris said, uh, which kind of having the luxury of walking into a room and thinking, well, nobody's thinking anything about me um, because white male is, is, was, is considered, for lack of a better term, the normal for, for, the, for the U.S. So I think for me, it was, it's, it's that... Um, uh, that piece, but where, where I have seen it, uh, particularly um, uh, within uh, uh, my professional career, has been, well, you're just coming here, over here, to, to do your white savior thing, and then you don't really, you know, that's your job, and then, uh, but, but you're, then you go back to your white world, and, um, and, and, and you don't see, though, you don't, you don't see that there's greater things at play here. Uh, and and that uh, getting into that fight. Okay, so Mike, to, you, you are um, are committed to it, to doing your part as a, a white man to, to end this shit, right? You're committed Absolutely. to it. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I wonder. We have a poll question going to come up in in a second, but before before we do that, Ron, I wanted to ask quickly. Um, you said you mentioned when you were. In, earlier in your career, um, you had perspectives, but now you're further along in your career um, and you, you're even a stronger ally at this point. Um, what, have, what have you done to move down that continuum to be where you are today? I think um, just really achieved greater understanding and, you know, through these experiences that I've had, um, I, I think, you know, as you walk into a room just knowing that the room itself and who's in it you're going to be viewed differently and every room um if they're you know different participants in whatever that particular event are going to be probably going to have a different opinion and and helping early um to understand that that exists and maybe try to disarm some of those opinions um, but again not doing it from this white savior perspective but i i think really trying to acknowledge that there are always going to be differences and those differences shouldn't divide us, they should bring us together. And so um, how, to, how to really address those. So 
I've just been committed to, you know, to continuing to have the conversation, um, continuing to allow people to call out my blind spots and accept it, right? I have to own those blind spots and, and really begin to change how I may be feeling or thinking. Um, you know, I, it was uh, not that long ago, I was in a room and, and somebody called out the BS and, you know, somebody else said to me afterwards, happened to be another white guy, how can you let somebody disrespect you like that? Like mm -hmm. they weren't disrespecting me. They were telling me what they see and what they see is a valid point. And if I'm not willing to listen to it, then I'm the white guy that they thought I was when I, you know, when we all walked into the room. So Chris, can you answer that one as well? You know, what, what have you done to, to improve what I, what I call, um, I will, I'll, I'll talk about that later, but what, what have you done to, um, grow in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space, and specifically racism. Yeah, absolutely, Claude. Um, I mean, I, I think I was, I was miseducated, right, in, in schools, uh, as well as outside of schools for all my life, right? And so I think it's on, it's on me to, to try to correct from that, right? So that's been um, reading, watching media, um, introducing myself to 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 scripts and 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 uh, stories that just weren't a part of of my initial whether it was my upbringing or my classroom that I was in right so so being in those spaces um, more recently it's been being in spaces uh, usually affinity spaces of other white people and talking about whiteness talking about racism talking about our privilege um, as well as our accountability um, and and, and I think just continuing to try to implement a, a racial lens and not just uh, overlooking it, right? And so remembering my my white identity, my whiteness, um, and and being able to talk about that. Okay, so th thanks. So let, let's go to poll question um, number two and see what the audience um, says about that. Panelists, you can now participate in the poll. Oh. <laughs> we'll give it a few more seconds for people to participate. All right, and we're closing. So do you believe white men have a responsibility to dismantle racism? 95% of people said yes. Three, no. And 3% are not sure. So uh, given, given that response, gentlemen, how, how do you see your role in that? Matt, let's start start with you. Well, I think I can think anecdotally better than sort of systemically. Um, the church that I serve has been around. It's in Chicago, up on the north side uh, in Lincoln Park. We've been here for in the city for 176 years. Um, as Claude knows, uh, founded UCAN way back when during the Civil War. Uh, yeah. And we're not like the richest church in the city by any by by a far shot but like a lot of white families we own property right we own um basically like half of a city block up on the north side a huge old church building and um i mentioned this earlier but when my colleague jamie frazier there his church was a new church start they're renting space from a theater subletting the theater wasn't paying their rent and so they all got evicted and one of my colleagues read about this in the Windy City Times, let me know. I called Jamie right away and said, why don't you come worship here this week? Uh, use our chapel. And we wound up in an arrangement where Lighthouse will be, that's the name of the church, Lighthouse will be here for, at St. Paul's for three years uh, without paying rent. And the money that they were paying rent is being invested so that they can wind up with a down payment on their own building after those three years. Um, and 
that took some pushing in our church from some of the more fiscally conservative people. Um, but we got there. And to my mind, in terms of just doing something, it was an acknowledgement that it is no accident that in this relationship, this white church owns a lot of property and African-American church doesn't. Uh, and what can we do about it? How can we share what we've got? And we could do a lot more, no doubt. But that to me felt like a good thing. Uh, and it wasn't, a, it was not my idea. It was developed in meetings with folks from Lighthouse Church. So that's one thing, but I feel like another way briefly is that I've just personally experienced is to be in places and environments where I have not just about race, but I just have things to learn from black people. And as a pastor of a Protestant church, I mean, the white Protestant church is in trouble, especially the progressive white Protestant church. We're dying. And I mean, my church is not, we're doing well, but you look at sort of best practices, who's doing well. It's your church, Claude. It's Trinity. It's uh, African in the city. It's African-American Protestantism is, is making those churches are making better decisions, generally have better leadership. So I have a lot to learn from my African-American colleagues uh, that so both of those things, I think, are have been helpful to me. OK, and Ron, can you speak on that? I think as I um, I think about what I can do, um, I, you know, it's a constant struggle. I, I think I have to keep questioning myself in into push, um, push myself and uh, and be in this space that's uncomfortable because I, I think I have to be committed if I'm really going to live the life that I'm trying to live and, and be true to the values that I have, then I have to be committed to being in the uncomfortable space. And that space exists with you know, folks, um, and, and I think we're all in this business, you, you know, probably everyone around this, this call, um, where oftentimes you're in a space where you have a program or a project that you're looking to fund and, and you need some, you know, you need some funding. Um, but then you have to look at is the source of that funding really aligned with the values that I have and make decisions of, you know, is it in the best interest of the of the greater efforts? And sometimes you have to walk away from those things um, if they're not. But at the same time, recognize that, okay, how, how are we going to advance what we're really trying to do and, and still stay on mission and still keep, you know, keep those efforts moving forward? So it you have to question, I mean, I feel like I need to question everything I do to make sure it's with the right values and intent and really continue to be opening to listening to those folks who are around me, um, listening to folks of, of black and brown folk, uh, black and brown folks around me to their, their feelings, their values, their needs. Um, and again, not be that white savior, but being a conduit to moving from talking about equity to actually achieving it. I think, you know, one of, one of our, I think it was either Twitter or LinkedIn um, gentlemen who com uh, commented even on this session saying, I wish it wasn't about achieving equity or advancing equity, it was about achieving equity. And, and I, I agree with that. And I, I think that's often my struggle where I, I um, think about that, that uh, white savior role. I feel we need to do this and time is of the essence. And then I, I you know, surround myself with some folks who are, are people of color and they're like, you need to just settle down a little bit. And, and so that's it. It's, it's the commitment to listening to those around me continuing to be in an uncomfortable space until it's no longer uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mike, Matt talked about Lighthouse Church with Pastor Jamie Frazier and um, African-American LGBTQ plus church and then their partnership. Can, what, what is Lutheran um, doing um, in the LGBTQ plus space? Sure. Um, so we, we as an organization uh, started on a journey, we call it WIDE, to be welcoming, inclusive, diverse, and equitable, uh, and looked at how within our organization um, and coming from uh, a, a Protestant tradition uh, that um, has some, some strong biblical opinions about the LGBTQ uh, community, um, how we, and what we can do to move our organization to be welcoming. Um, so we, we pursued the, uh, through the human rights campaign, the All Children, All Families seal, 
uh, and obtain that seal um, uh, at the innovative level, which is the highest, to show that we're demonstrating all that we can do um, to uh, be welcoming to the LGBTQ plus community um, and are still on that journey. Um, it's not like uh, we don't have a ways to go, but it, it's adjusting policies, adjusting um, uh, uh, verbiage in, in, in pieces that go out, making sure when someone walks into one of our offices, they see pictures of people that look like them. So that, that, that includes um, uh, both the issues of race uh, and the LGBT plus, plus community. But there are proactive things uh, and, and, um, and people that you can partner with that can help you on the journey. And, and, and that's what LCFS has done. Okay, Ron, how about you? Well, I think um, from our, you know, in my current role um, as Illinois market president, our company is, is actually very focused on equity, not just, uh, not just color, but also sexual orientation and, and gender. And, you know, we continue from a HR perspective to really lean into how are we, how are really, really portraying ourselves? Are we living the values that we have as, as a uh, company? But I, I feel like I'm in a, an odd spot. I, you know, I mean, represent the state of Illinois for affordable housing in our, in our company. But I, I work with a relatively small team in doing that. So I it, it look around the table um, and I see a quite diverse group of folks who are, who are helping us achieve um, the greater mission of advancing affordable housing. But then what's happening in our community and how, how do I show up there? Um, it, it's, a, it's a very um, personal role for me. I spent a, a lot of time um, down in, in the Chicago area talking about LGBTQ issues. Um, my brother was gay and I think Claude, as you know, he was, he was killed in 2004. And I saw a different side of hate back then that you know, my brother lived on a daily basis. So you know, the experience of seeing it against people of color, the experience of seeing it against folks who, um, you know, who are, are queer or gay, transgendered, et cetera, you really, you know, we really need to think about equity across the, you know, across the whole um, spectrum of people that we work with and try to represent. And Ron, ha has that fight um, around your brother's uh, murder, has that fight empowered you even more? It has, and I, I think, you know, that, that was about the time that it was empowering me around LGBTQ issues was the same time I was growing in leadership at the Housing Authority and seeing that while wow, these issues of equity, um, they just have different sources of, of hate and they, you know, they, they really are very common. And I, I think that's the challenge you get into when you're trying to address issues of, of color, of gender, of, of sexual orientation. There's a need by that individual to, to feel heard. And, you know, if you had, let's say, a, a gay female of color, she's going to have a whole different needs and experiences in the community than a gay man of, you know, being white. They're just all different. And so how do we, how do we really adjust um, our role in trying to help uh, equity happen there? Because as a straight white male, it's going to be significantly different for me, but recognizing it's going to be, you know, my, my role in the community is different, but it should always be as a steward. So I want to switch to uh, gender inequities in the workplace. And um, I'll start with, with Matt and ask, ask you, so the church um, has been notorious um, for discriminating against women and, and in positions of power. Um, how, how have you reconciled that well, I haven't reconciled it for the whole church yet, um, <laughs> but as St. Paul's, we're trying, and uh, we're fortunate that our tradition, the United Church of Christ, um, was, I, I joke, I, 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 laugh, I laugh because it, it feels like I'm telling you, Claude, what you already know, but the United Church of Christ was the first denomination to ordain a woman uh, way back in 1783, so we've been out in front uh to some degree on that question although we're as entrenched and and in the culture as anybody else and so um it, it's an ongoing issue i would say the primary three ways that we try to address this at saint paul's are a we make sure that we have um 
gender equity in our lay leadership. So our tradition is run by its members. I don't have a whole lot of hierarchical authority in our church. It's my job to make sure decisions get made, not to make them. So our boards um, are, uh, if not majority women, 50-50, uh, all of them. We make sure that if there's a man in the three-year term as president, that we have a woman the next time. If there's a woman, we don't make sure there's a man the next time. Another, you know, it can be a woman after that. We, those, that's kind of informal. Um, we make sure that we have female pastoral staff so that there are women. Um, Reverend Sarah Garcia is, is a, one of our three ministers leading worship, preaching, celebrating the sacraments, modeling for children, girls and boys, what that looks like, that it's a possibility for them if they wanted to be a clergy person, but also just because kids have this Godward gaze and, and clergy uh, often wind up um, being the object of it when they're little and um, just to model that and then finally and this gets me and I'd say once a month I get in a, in a somewhat thorny conversation about this but we try to use female language for God as often as we do male in our worship services so uh, we say the Lord's Prayer every week our Father so we make sure it's someplace to offset that we're saying we're referring to God as she uh, and we do it um, a lot. And for new people to the church, it's alarming and, and upsetting sometimes. For people who have been here for years, it's just the way of things. But those are three kind of practical ways that we're trying. Well, I don't know how practical God talk is, but it's a way that we're trying to get at it. Okay. And Mike, how about you? Sure. So, um, you know, LCFS is a human service organization, not as old as you can, but 147 years. And if you look at human services, social work, um, it's a it's, uh, 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 large part of the workforce is female, a uh, uh, higher percentage of the workforce is people of color, but it's guys who look just like me at the top of almost every organization. Um, so, so that's an area uh, where I think as a sector and, and, and as, as my organization, we have a lot of work to do on. Um, uh, so as, as we're looking at how we um, uh, proactively uh, uh, look at not just women, but people of color uh, for leadership opportunities within our organization, um, we, it's, it's, it hasn't evolved beyond that conversation to say, how do we uh, make sure that we are uh, taking the vast majority of our workforce um, uh, and ensuring that uh, they have equitable opportunity to move up uh, and, and uh, move into uh, other professional positions that they would, if, if they so choose to. So we have work to do on that. Um, Mike, is your, like say at, at your board level and then at your C-suite level, how, how do you look? Our C-suite is, um, uh, there's four of us. We have two African-American women vice presidents uh, and one um, a white Caucasian male vice president. Uh, our board, we have some, some work to do, both in gender uh, and um, uh, both gender. Uh, one of the challenges in front of me now is, is looking at gender, looking at uh, racial mix-up, and really uh, we want to uh, get client voice uh, onto our board of trustees also. So that's, that's one of my goals for the coming year is to look at our board makeup and, and improve that. We do have women, we do have um, uh, people of color, but we'd like to do uh, better given, given the, the, the makeup of the people we serve as well as um, getting to the point of where we have uh, uh, people that um, have been service recipients uh, onto our board of trustees uh, and representing that voice also. Okay, and Chris, can you talk, um, you've been at UCAN like four months, right? <laughs> a little more, but not, not too much, yeah, that's right. Um, can you, can you um, talk about how you support um, the female staff at UCAN in, in your role? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, a lot of my role is, is, is engagement and development of staff, right? And so it's directly working with our staff. I'm, I'm a step or two removed from our direct participant work, but I, I certainly seek out those opportunities when I get them. But a lot of it is working with, with our staff. And so I think that's really thinking um, holistically about our staff, right? Especially certainly now during this pandemic, but always like, 
how are you doing? How are you really? Um, and asking those questions and not limiting it to it just the work, right? So when I'm in supervision with a staff member, uh, we will we will start um, very often with the check-in, right? And there have been staff where we will end talking about what their strengths are in this work because very regularly uh, the world and the work can knock you down. And so it's important to really remember um, all of who you are and what you bring um, and what you do. Um, and so, so for me, um, you know, specifically, I know Claude, you asked about like the gender lines of that, right? Um, yeah. I think that's, that's, you know, that's elevating voices, right? So just as my work sometimes in a, in a room as a white person, right, um, is acknowledging that um, my own identity, right, and my presence um, and building solidarity, right? The same thing happens along gender. And I think it also is really important too, and I know Ron, I think referenced this too, right? Is that um, our staff, just like our participants, all of them don't identify as men and women, right? And so making space for that too, those folks that identify beyond the binary um, and really uh, stewarding leadership uh, opportunities for, for everyone, but certainly for, for women as well as part of that. Um, and really, really making space for, for everyone to, to be at that table, right? Even if that means giving up my seat, because um, very often I don't, I don't need to be at the table. Okay, thanks. So we're, we're gonna take a, a, a quick pivot. Uh, we invited a special guest um, to come in and be with us today, um, the former Secretary of Education for the United States under President Barack Obama. Uh, Mr. Arnie Duncan, who's currently um, president of CRED. And I, I've known Arnie, man, many, many, many years um, and have seen his commitment um, from the top from a policy perspective, but more important from a personal perspective where his concern is a deep concern and wanting to lead and be an ally. And an example, probably a couple years ago, he was visiting our, our campus. And, um, you know, he, he's a funder. Um, and one of the young people that's in our, in our program was actually um, being chased down by some other people and um, came into the facility. And we were able to help him be safe and make it back home and kind of mediate the situation that could have turned um, literally deadly right then in the afternoon. And as we were sitting in the meeting, Arnie kept wondering how that situation was going and was that young man safe and things like that. And then I was able to say to him and assure him, you know, we, he's okay, he'll be okay. We've talked to both sides and, and things will go on from here. And then to know that young man is um, in college now is a good thing. So Arnie, I wanted you to come in and just share your perspective um, on being a white man um, in this country and what you want to see happen um, so that we can end this pandemic uh, of racism in, in any way that we can in our lifetimes. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for all your leadership. And this is a little bit different conversation. So you got me thinking. I just think in all this stuff, sort of it's a juxtaposition, two things are true sort of race matters in everything we do um, in everything and you can't blow through it. And the flip side of it is like, it shouldn't matter. So whether you're a white man or white woman or black, Latino or you know, Asian American, Native American, I think we all have a role to play if we care. Um, none of us get a pass. Um, we can talk about history and legacy and why we are where we are. And that's really, really important to understand but I'm always trying to focus on, you know, how do we take those lessons, but how do we, how do we move forward? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm all, for better or worse, I'm always honest. Um, my personal opinions with the, the current administration, we've taken a major step backwards as a country in terms of, of equity, in terms of uh, caring about everybody. And uh, again, my personal opinion is uh, not all of it by any stretch, but a decent amount of this is a backlash to having our first African-American president. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, for some of us was, you know, beyond historic. And for me personally was a chance of a lifetime to be part of that team. Um, but I, again, I'll speak for myself. I didn't fully anticipate 
the, the national blowback to that and how scary um, his leadership and what President Obama represented, how scary that was to so many. Um, and the final thing I'll say is that it's really important. I try not to, uh, I try not to judge. I try not to lay blame. I think more than ever before, we need to understand and we need to build bridges. And then we need to talk to folks who think very differently than us and have very different experiences. And if all we're doing is trying to prove how right we are and how wrong they are, I don't think that we got we to stitch the country together. We got to try and heal. So this is not about thinking you're doing more than someone or you're better than somebody. It's about how do we, how do we try and find our com common humanity in a really, really, really hard time. So Arnie, one of the poll questions earlier was um, what role do white men have in eradicating, reducing, or dismantling racism? And it was 92% um, poll that said, yeah, yes, you do play a role. So ta tangibly, wh what are you doing um, to make that a reality? I mean, I think we're all trying. I'll say, I, I know I'm not doing enough. I don't know if any of us are doing enough. I think all you can try and do is, is lead by example. You try and live your values as, as clearly and honestly and authentically as you can. Um, I can talk about a lot of things. I can say a lot of things. I can give you a lot of my opinions of where we are today and how we got here and what happened historically. And, I, you know, that's helpful. I don't want to minimize that, but I think the most important thing I can do is try and try and live my values and people are going to, you know, they'll listen to you, but they're going to, they're going to watch what you do more than they're going to listen to what you say. Mm -hmm. Similar to Matt, where they say, I'd rather um, see a sermon than hear a sermon any, any day. <laughs> along those lines. And so Arnie, if you, there was a, a situation at, at your alma mater lab where the students felt like they weren't being heard. Um, and they voiced their opinion in, in writing. Um, how, how has that gotten better or improved? I think every place has challenges, has issues. My, uh, my own mom, I mean, I know my, my two kids are in high school there now, so they were living it, and we were talking it through at night, and um, that's, uh, you know, it's, it was a, a disappointing situation. It's one that hurts you in your heart, but I always say, um, this is reality. And I'd rather deal with hard reality. I'd rather deal with the messy truth. I think historically, we as a country has swept so much of this under the rug. Mm -hmm. And so hard conversations, painful, you know, difficult conversations, I'm actually a big fan of those. And yeah. I'd yeah. Rather, be, rather be trying to work through stuff and trying to, you know, get through the messiness than acting like we're in some post-racial society. <laughs> Because I would, I would argue we're, we're further from being a post-racial society uh, than we have in a, in a while. And to have, again, always my personal opinion, to have you know, someone in the White House openly and honestly advocating and supporting those that are perpetuating hate, that are perpetuating racism, that are perpetuating violence, that's a really scary thing. And it gives lots of people permission who may have thought things and felt some things to to bring that out into the forefront. And, um, you know, we're seeing an escalation in, in bullying and, uh, you know, other things in schools um, because people think that's now okay. If, if the guy in the White House can say those things, then it, then it must be okay. That's, that's empowering. So we all have to um, counter that as, as, as best we can, again, in an extraordinarily difficult time. Mm -hmm. So a couple more questions. Um, they talk... There, Beverly D'Angelo's book, um, White Fragility, uh, there's a whole chapter or so that talks about just the, the construct of whiteness and then the difficulty um, for white people to have this conversation, um, which is one of the, I, I won't call it an excuse, let's just say one of the um, dynamics for why it, it's not talked about as much. You just referenced that you revel in having these conversations. What, what could you say to other people then um, to get there? Yeah, that, that's a, it's a good question, I guess, for, for better or worse, you know, all my life, my trainings, I've just been in tough situations. So that's, <laughs> that's sort of what, what I know. And, um, you know, I, I like peace. I like tranquility. I like all that good stuff. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> 
I feel, I feel, uh, you know, a, a high degree of comfort. I'll just say that in, in more challenging, more difficult situations. And I'll say very honestly, I actually consciously or unconsciously, I sort of seek those out because I know my growth, you know, as a person, as a trying to be a leader, as a basketball player, you and I play a lot together. Yeah. You put yourself in uncomfortable situations. You don't do what's easy. And so if you want to stretch, if you want to grow, if you want to improve, if you want to test yourself, the only way I know how to do that is to, you know, go into find situations, create situations, you know, nurture situations that force you to, uh, to stretch, to learn, to, to hear some things that, um, you know, might sting a little bit or might be a little hard, but that's how, um, at least for me, that's, that's the only way I know how to get better. I think the flip side of that is if you're around people telling you, you know, how good you are and how smart you are and how everything's right. good. Um, that's actually for me, a recipe for disaster. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's actually self-destructive. And, um, so I try to, you know, I think consciously and consciously and unconsciously walk away from those comfortable situations and go to a more comfortable. So to answer your question directly for those where this is hard, I would just say, yeah, it, it is hard. And I don't want to say it's easy for me by any stretch. It is hard. I guess my point is if it's not hard, then there isn't a point. Then you're not growing. Then you're not learning. Then you're not contributing. You're getting soft. You're getting complacent. And that, for me, that's way more scary a space to be in than, than the opposite. Right. So last question. Um, this current, current economic, political landscape. Um, when I saw um, what was happening in Michigan where these angry white men um, with assault weapons and things like that um, were defi defying the government, um, and they were called protesters, actually. Um, if, if I was to do that with a bunch of brothers and stuff like that, um, and we went there, um, I don't think we would have been met with the same type of grace. No. Um, how, how, do, how do you, um, I, I can't even think of the word. How, how do you approach a situation like that? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, the contrast is um, jarring, it's deeply unsettling, it's disturbing, but for me, the contrast is whether it's Michigan now or Charlottesville um, versus Colin Kaepernick and, you know, his, his defiance that angered so many and <laughs> created so much consternation was he bent down on one knee, um, didn't say a word, wasn't armed, Right. Wasn't doing anything. And that terrified people. That terrified people. And um, I, the only explanation, and I, I hope I'm wrong, the only explanation I can come up with is that our, not, I don't want to say our country, but it's too broad, and I'll be careful my language here, but many in our country are still terrified by blackness and whether it's you know Colin whether it's the shootings of so many unarmed you know young men and children you know and young man jogging in, in, in Georgia recently that what is terrifying is the color of of your skin uh, not not my skin mm -hmm. and that someone on a knee feels feels more scary that that person is your complexion rather than mine than a bunch of people my complexion with AK-47s and weaponry that, that belongs on a, on a battlefield, not in civil society and definitely not at a, a state capital. And so it's, it's, again, deeply troubling to me, deeply disturbing. And call it conscious, call it unconscious bias, call it whatever you want. But for me, it just lets me know how far we have to go and, and, and how much more work we, we have to do. So question, Arnie, I know you have um, a, a real tight schedule on today. Um, 
we started our session, um, there, were, there was some angst by um, ver various people of color and um, women about why we're even doing something like this. And um, I, I welcome the, the angst and the, skin, the cynicism and skepticism. What, what would you say um, to those who, who are critical of white men for where the country is today? I think, you know, any criticism is, you know, fair or not fair. I, I, one thing I really try not to do, Claude, is, is judge. Um, I would just caution any of us to not stereotype a people or a race or a gender into, we can, we can talk and study history and understand history and, you know, that's, that's so important. But anytime any of us looks at, at another human being and based upon physical characteristics, makes some judgment about what that person has done or, or hasn't done, um, that for me is a real problem. And um, I'll, the, the flip side of this is just very quickly, you know, the work, work we're doing together now to reduce violence where, you know, working with young men, you know, 99% of whom are African-American on the South and West sides. And I know how they are perceived by society. Mm -hmm. um, I know how they sometimes perceive themselves. Um, these are men who have often been victims of violence. Many candidly have perpetuated violence, have shot others. And um, what I say every day, and I believe my heart, is that they, they are the solution to the problem. They are not the problem themselves. And they're going to lead Chicago to a better place. Me and you and our teams can, can help and to walk and to learn and to guide. But me and you aren't out there shooting anybody. Right. These are the guys that are choosing to do something different. So for me to, um, to judge who they are or their motives or good person, bad person, um, I can't, I can't do that anymore. And so I just, that lesson that I'm learning every single day, um, I would just encourage those that, you know, are, you know, are, are judging a people based upon a, a physical perception, just to really, really try hard not to do that. And again, judge people not on what they look like, go back to where we started, Judge them maybe a little bit on what they say, but judge them a lot on what they uh, what you see. Okay, so Arnie, thank hey, thanks for coming in um, and being with us today, and help helping to have this conversation um, specifically, and then for for the work you're doing um, on the south and west sides and the work you've done across the country um, around equity. Um, I, I think it is noteworthy. So uh, I appreciate the work you're thanks. doing. Becca, thanks for your leadership and you know, one of many, maybe courageous conversations you can lead and open it up to some other forums and some exactly. stuff. And again, um, we can't run from this stuff. We gotta, we gotta put it out there. And I, I think when we put it out there, we don't solve the world's problems, but we just make a little bit of progress. So uh, All right. keep pushing and keep leading. I appreciate it. Hey, Arnie, how many points did you score in the All-Star game, man? This not enough, not right. enough. We gotta, we gotta dump it, that's all that matters. <laughs> All right. I'll talk to you. Take care. Thanks, man. Be cool. Thank you. All right. So let's go to our third poll question um, now. Our third poll question, because our, our time is um, almost up, is how hopeful are you that racism will end in your lifetime? We'll give it another second for people to respond. You see how fast time goes? Um, <laughs> already. All right. So how are we looking? So it looks like 1% is very hopeful, 40% is slightly hopeful, and 58% of people are not hopeful. Okay. So we'll be sharing um, this recording. We'll be sharing all the results of the polls and things like that. Um, but Chris, when you see that, what does that make you think about? 
reality. Um, I think people are uh, day to day confronting, witnessing, living racism, right? And I know uh, Arnie shared a few examples. We also know Breonna Taylor recently was murdered in her home sleeping, right, in Kentucky. Um, you know, I, I, I think um, I think it's just people's lived experience. Um, and so it's hard to imagine what the world looks like when that, when that ends. Matt, how about you? Well, I answered slightly hopeful um, because I'm in a hopeful business and I'm a hopeful person, but uh, I don't think I have rose colored glasses on. I was struck by something that Arnie said around the fear of blackness and thinking about experiences I've had uh, through my kids really that have allowed me to enter uh, African-American culture and spaces and I've been able to witness and participate in the beauty of black culture and uh, in a way that felt like um, as an outsider but maybe not an interloper and to come away personally changed by these encounters. Um, but I would say that that's well and good and we can individually be changed and those of us white men with some power can um, use those experiences to try to dismantle. But ultimately, and it pains me to say this, I think um, what the language that we speak as Americans is money. And, uh, you know, racism, American racism, hatred of black people is rooted in economic exploitation, obviously. And I think the only way that we're going to end this is economically uh, through reparations. And there's a reason that we have a prayer of confession in our worship service every week. It's not because it changes God, but because it changes our self-understanding. And I think until white people are taxed and have to pay and reckon with the privilege that we have economically, it, we can just ignore it. And so I, I'm hopeful because the conversation around reparations has taken on a new tenor in the last 10 years uh if it falls silent i'll lose that hope and i, I want to switch mike really quick i want to go uh, and ask uh, around immigration policy and just your your perspective on how your organization is approaching it and ron if you could do the same too and then we'll jump into our q a well i'm not sure what you mean by immigration policy I mean, for us, anybody who walks into our door for one of our services, um, are we equipped to serve them? Um, and uh, so, you know, we, a, a good portion of uh, immigrants to the U.S. are, are, are Spanish speaking. Yes. So we made efforts uh, to add that bilingual capacity in a significant way, as well as um, uh, uh, hiring uh, Latinx folks. Uh, that have a better understanding of the culture, but being very conscious of, well, uh, an immigrant from uh, Mexico is very different than an immigrant from Guatemala. Um, we can't lump Latinx folks uh, all into one uh, bucket, uh, which we like to do in our country, mm -hmm. um, which helps, helps stem through all that. So, uh, and, and that, you know, we see very interesting dynamics when we started to move pretty significantly to make sure that we could serve the Latinx population um, we there were there was a pushback organizationally um, both from other other staff people of color um, that represented a, a different um, uh, ethnic group as well as as the traditional Caucasian um, and we there was even dialogue of um, we're moving away from being American <laughs> uh, um, so it's 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 been uh, and, and again, for us, it's been how do we not extinguish those conversations, but let's have those conversations. Uh, you know, when someone goes, okay, well, let's, let's, let's unpack this. Um, but let's be really clear, um, if you cannot be welcoming, uh, then this may not be the organization for you. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Uh, I think, you know, from our perspective, or at least the, the work we're doing, um, we're in a housing world, so we must provide housing to all folks equally. 
And I think in some cases, though, we're looking at working in neighborhoods that have typically been disconnected or lack um, access to essential services within a community. And sometimes those may be immigrant populations. And I, I think um, a little bit to Mike's point, there, there really are none of us who are Americans, so to speak, original. The, you know, the, uh, the um, American Indian, Native American Indians are, are the ones who are here first. And so interestingly, you know, again, as white folks, oftentimes we believe we've become the you know, representatives of America, which we weren't. We all immigrated here. Um, some of us immigrated here by choice. My grandfather um, came from England, my grandmother from England, my, my grandfa other grandfather from Poland. Um, but we also have to recognize some of us didn't come here voluntarily and were immigrated here and sold, etc. So the, the idea of, of immigration, it's the fabric of who we are. I mean, you know, as a melting pot of a number of, of different nationalities, we have to, we really have to think about that's the America that people wanted not the America that white guys want to hold on to. So I'm gonna to go to a poll, poll question and our, our time is 1121. So let's try and answer just two poll questions and um, we get, we'll be close to ending our session. It says, can we talk more about white males opening doors it seems like a powerful tool, but I can totally understand how that can feel to people of color. Any suggestions on how and when to open doors appropriately? Does anybody want to take that question? I think uh, from my perspective, back uh, as CEO of the Housing Authority, we were, um, we really looked at our, our team's uh, demographic makeup and we looked at how we are approaching equity. And I, I think it's, it's again, that fine line of not being the white savior, but opening the doors and making sure that we're filling roles with, with people of color, with, with females, et cetera. Um, it, you know, it, it's again, I think going to be one of those uncomfortable situations because some folks may view it as opening the door and appreciate it. Other folks may view it as opening a door and condescending and that's not the intent, but I, I think um, just, just sharing that, like we're going to make some mistakes as we move forward and just be here with us, be part of the team and help us do it in a way that's meaningful to you. And it may be not so meaningful to somebody else, but, but, you know, it may be um, troubling to somebody else. So let's, let's create the safe space to have the conversation that one person views as troubling another person views it as helpful. And then let's, let's just wrap around the fact that we're trying to create this team um, that that is in a space that can do good, and so hopefully um, most folks, if you know if you're a white guy and you're you're trying to address equity, um, it's viewed as authentic. And there was a question for uh, Matt as well. It says Pastor Matt mentioned pushback from fiscal conservatives in his church. How often do we see practicality as a reason for not addressing racism? Well, I think, I mean, in my life, all the time. And um, I don't think it gets like named that blatantly, but economic self-interest and, and the desire to keep what, what one has, what we have uh, to protect our, our wealth uh, from any source that would take it from us is, you know, shot through our culture. It's the, the values we're taught around what it is to be a significant, important person or institution. Um, we don't want to give up our money. And so, or engage in practices that are going to cost us money necessarily, even a church. And so I think that um, racism gets expressed as economic conservatism uh, often in, in, in ways that race itself doesn't even get mentioned. So we we'll go to another poll question, and we're at 11:25 right now. So we'll take one more. Um, what role does the media, social media, news, entertainment have in addressing racism? Chris or Mike, can you take that one? Sure. Um, I mean that that's a 
that's a, an easy one, I guess, for lack of a better term, an easy, uh, hard, hard one. You know, we look at um, uh, how uh, the media portrays, particularly um, African American young males. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, they they pr portray them as as gangsters and someone to be afraid of. Um, it's very rare that uh, you hear a story, a positive story. Um, but if there's, uh, you know, we we've all seen it, or um, if there's a shooting in a white community, it's all over the news. <laughs> the, the daily shootings in, in uh, a black or brown community go completely unnoticed uh, and, and, and rarely reported. Um, so it's, I think the media plays and, and social media, which is becoming the new media platform, um, is very indicative of, of the systemic racism and, uh, and, and using what those mediums to, to keep it going. So I think there needs to be a, a real significant shift uh, uh, in, in the media because that's how so many of us consume um, opinion in this country. And Chris, can you expound on that quickly? Yeah, so I was gonna go to the social media piece actually. So when there's, um, whether it's, it's a murder um, or a deportation or some crime against um, someone as Leila Saad calls them, uh, black people, indigenous people, or people of color, that's her uh, language. Um, I, on my social media, see all of my uh, friends and colleagues of color posting about it. And I don't see white people doing that as often, right? So, and so remembering that um, we all have a platform, right? And so whether that's a virtual platform um, or, or elsewhere, knowing that um, we all have a responsibility to, to spread the truth um, and to, to spread that uh, news. So in, in, in closing, uh, we have about three minutes. Where do you want to grow um, as a white man, as an ally in the fight against inequity? I'd say, Claude, I would like to get my own experience of an advocate, as an advocate, outside of the church circles that I work in. So just to get outside of my own realm um, would be good for me. Okay, Ryan. You know, I think there's just many places I need to grow and want to grow. Um, I, I think, uh, to Matt's point about outside your circles, I, you know, I, I find myself, um, luckily find myself in very many circles but maybe being seen differently, helping myself be seen differently in those circles. And, and again, as an advocate, um, that is turning to an ally because I, I think for a long time, I've viewed my own self as an advocate. I think people probably would say that's true, but I want them to see that I'm truly an ally. Mike? I, I think I'd echo what, what Ron said is how to move from advocate to ally uh, and to make sure we're doing that in, in both an effective way um, but also in a way um, that, that, again, is seen as, as a true ally uh, and um, coming alongside of the disenfranchised and using and doing what I can do uh, to help um, achieve a, a greater equity. Okay, Chris. Yeah, I mean, I certainly would echo all of that. I think, um, you know, for me, I've heard some people use use the term accomplice rather than ally, right? Because there's, a, there's something you have at stake, right? Uh, for me, um, though I won't say it's ever easy, um, you know, I can show up, um, I can speak up, I should do both of those things more, but I don't act up enough, right? And so I, I need to be more accountable um, and more physically and, uh, and verbally involved, right? And have something on the line because we all, we all have skin. Great. So I want to thank um, the, pan the panelists for agreeing to, to be a part of the discussion. Um, I think a lot of times we've heard that specifically from this group of um, white men who are striving to become better and striving to become allies in the fight to end racism. A good friend of mine uh, was saying that, Claude, man, this is a pie in the sky, man. It ain't happening. Why are you trying to do this? and stuff like that. But I, I've seen 
over the years and I've heard from white men who said, I, I want to do this. I just don't know how. And if there's no conversation about that, where people can look at themselves individually and say, how do I get better? How do I lead in my space? Then there will be no change at all. And I wanted to leave, leave us with um, a quote that, that I recently read um, from Audre Lorde. And I want this to us to think about ourselves, not be critical of anybody else, but at this point in time, at this moment in your life, to take this reflection with you. I have found that battling despair does not mean closing my eyes to the enormity of the task of effective change, nor ignoring the strength and the barbarity of the forces aligned against us. It means teaching, serving, and fighting with the most important resource I have, which is myself, and taking joy in that battle. I want you to take that with you. And if you found this helpful in any way, um, join us in the conversation as we continue to try and be what so many people are skeptical of and say can't happen, join us in this fight. And with that, I bid everybody a good day. Take care. Thanks, Claude. Thank, Thank you, Claude. Thanks, Claude. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks, Claude.